<laughs> All right, let's get going then. Yeah, hello. So my name is Armin. I'm a product specialist with Notch. I'm here with my colleague, Ryan. Hello. So uh, we had quite a few nice questions coming in in the last stream that we did, and we figured it would be quite a good time to make a stream specifically just for the questions and answers. So a while ago, we released a form where you could uh, ask questions that you are interested in, and we're gonna address them all today, and we're gonna take questions in the chat room as well. Uh, in the hot seat today, we have Ryan. That's great. Yay, Ryan yeah, in the hot seat. <laughs> I'm gonna get and some I'm break. Gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna talk to you guys on chat uh, and I'm gonna read the questions that we have that came in from you guys so we can start up with the first one uh, will there be NotchCon this year I was unable to attend the first one well NotchCon was uh, initially conceived as a one-time event but uh, who knows if demand is there and we have the energy I, I think it's quite plausible, though I have to say that nothing is set out for 2020 as we have full full hands-on uh, of uh, focus on, on the releases that are coming up. Uh, and if you missed out the first one, you can always go to our YouTube channel, Notch YouTube channel, and there's a whole playlist of NotchCon talks and they're all brilliant. It's, it's very nice to refer to them from time to time. It's just really good information there. Yeah, NotchCon was really fun really really fun but uh it was also a lot of work so it won't be anytime soon but we yeah with that said it was a hell of a lot yeah. of fun as well so. we were not we're definitely not against doing uh, having fun again no just... no i think we enjoyed it just as much as people who attended that but okay let's go to the practical questions then um so there is one asking how to make a particle emitter work stably from the start in the beginning, it releases a large number of particles, then less. Thank you. Ryan, would you have a tip there? So the thing with particle with a uh, particle emitter is you've got to find a balance between three properties. So, well, at least if you're going for a consistent run of particles. So I'm going to start with get, making a very simple uh, scene, which will sort of show this um, effect in an exaggerated way. So I'll get this uh, this uh, primitive emitter here, we'll emit them as a circle, and we'll just force them to move upwards, like so. Just move that down a bit, face upward. Now we don't see anything because I've got to put on a point renderer. There we go. So now we can see we're getting this sort of hockey puck sort of effect of these particles moving upwards, which is not what we want. This is uh, what we're looking for is a consistent run of particles. Now the reason this is happening is because of the particle emission rate. So if we see, uh, I'll just zoom out a bit. Here, by showing metrics, I can see each primitive, each particle emitter, which there's only one in this scene, and we can see how much, how many particles it's trying to emit, it's trying to emit, and how many particles are actually active. So we can see here we've got thirty thousand it wants to emit, and it's reached that max. And when we run the scene again, we can see what's happening is it's reaching that max very, very quickly. And as soon as it reaches that max, it can't emit more particles. And so we get this sort of run of particles that sort of need to die off before the rest of the particles can emit. And this is pretty easy to work, work around. So for example, this is the primitive in the primitive emitter. You should see four, you should see these attributes here, the life, the life randomness and the emission rate. So with the life, um, obviously the longer a particle lives, the longer, the more time it's going to spend in the scene and the more time it's going to spend taking out of that pool. So if I just raise the particle life a bit, we can see this problem becomes a lot more exaggerated. The other thing that's affecting this issue is the life randomness. So particles aren't always going to live this max rate depending on the life randomness. This is going to randomize their life between um, five seconds and I don't know a tenth of that 
So if we lower this emission, uh, life randomness to zero, we can see we get a very clear block or um, puck of particles which move forward. And again, this is because these particles all emit, they get stuck in the, um, the emitter pool and there's no more that can be emit. So, uh, and, uh, right. and the final one is the emission rate. So if I lower this emission rate to be quite low, we can see we're getting that consistent push of particles, but we've also got a lot of particles which aren't actually being used in the effect. And I can raise this till we get relatively close. I think like 4.2 or 4.3 was quite close. And if I reset the scene again, we see it's emitting particles and it gets fairly close to this max count, but it never quite reaches it. And that is how you can try and avoid this system. It's a combination of these three attributes. For example, it's not just about lowering the emission rate. If I add more life to it, we can see we still hit that max cap and then we just get a larger sort of puck. So finding a balance a bit between these three uh, attributes is the way you'd want to do this. All right, cool. That was a very in-depth answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> Prepare <laughs> um, for more. <laughs> very good. Uh, I'm checking the list now and I see that the next one uh, is uh, actually with a video a video reference. And a question, how would I recreate this in Notch? Ryan, would you have that video uh, reference in the questionnaire available? I could do, yes. So I think this was a video from Facebook by Rene Brokop. I hope I'm not pronouncing that too terribly. Oh, look at that. That looks great. It's very nice. And there's a swoosh. Yeah, so it's a pretty nice effect. It's just uh, using image, image effector, switching what image is being used inside the image effector, and then running an, a particle animation in between so that things get moved around. So if we were to break it down, it's basically two pictures. So uh, picture A is being hidden, and uh, picture B is being revealed with a swoosh of particles. Yeah, effectively that. And um, there's a little. It looks like there's a little bit more going on in the background, and obviously there's some post effects going on as well. Lots of really uh, nice stuff. So let's see how we could replicate that in a at least a sim a fairly simple well, setup. Yeah, let's let's set it up in a, in a basic setting, and then from there on, I guess it can be pushed further and made nicer, and so on and so forth. So again, we're going to be using particles. I'll just bring in a particle root and an image emitter. So now we've got how we're going to emit our particles and we've got the particle root that we actually want to emit our particles from. Uh, the next thing is we need a point renderer so we can actually visualize the particles that we're using. And finally, uh, we need a vortex effector. So this is going to be how we're going to transition between these two images. I think he used uh, some curl noise as well, but I'm just going to keep it simple. Just go with the vortex effector for now. <clears throat> so the next step we need is two images to swap between. Uh, Armin kindly sent me over these two from the last stream. That is one nice octopus, you have to admit. A bloody lovely octopus, octopus and a bloody boring house, that's what. <laughs> well, th there's always a winner, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. So if we want to switch between two video sources, the best node to use for that, I find, is the multiplex sources. What this node does is it takes two nodes in and it allows you to switch between the two. So here we can see it's set to source zero, which is the first um, object in which is the first image. And if I change it to one, we're now using the second image. And I can just swap between these very easily. And so as I connect this to the image emitter, turn off my vortex effector briefly. You see, we can now see we've got our uh, house. And then when I change the source, we get that change to a uh, an octopus. Now, one thing I have noticed is you can see those little black particles at the edges. And that's because this um, image is actually emitting the black area of it as well. And I don't want that. So I'm just going to quickly, instead of using the alpha channel, to cull the dark areas, I'm going to set it to luminance. 
So now you can see all these particles are dying off as all as they're uh, not bright enough to be allowed to contrib uh, contribute. And actually, if I raise this alpha threshold a bit, you can probably find a point where you're only left with white particles. So that works. I can swap between them, but I want what we want to do is we want to have some sort of animation which blends between these two. And to do that, I'm going to take this vortex effector, turn it to zero, so it's not going to animate anything. And we're going to create a triggerable animation that twists these particles as we, uh, uh, as and when we require. So using the triggerable envelope modifier, what this we can key this value. And when we key this value, we're given an animation that we can trigger at any point we need it to. So if I, for example, just say at zero, it's zero, at one, it's one, and at two, you probably guessed it, it's zero. So now we have an animation that when triggered, it will go on and then it will go off. Now, we want to connect this to our vortex effector because what we want to do is have it so that when we trigger this animation, it will make these particles move and then it'll, when the particles stop moving, you'll be left with the um, you'll be left with the new image. So now with the trigger, triggerable envelope here, we now need something external to trigger it and we also need something to switch the effect. So I'm going to add an envelope modifier. Now this is going to be our control. So when we want to um, control the switching, we want to do it from this node, or we're going to do it from this node. So we're going to take from the multiplex, we're going to connect the envelope to the source. So now when we change, the, we change this node, we're changing the source. Then from here, we're going to connect this to the trigger. And now when this node reaches one, it's going to activate this trigger and activate this animation. Now the trigger envelope is constantly activating because I forgot to change the trigger mode. The trigger mode is set to constant means that it's going to constantly run when the trigger is activated and we actually just want it to happen once on a change. So now I can change it back and we get the octopus. Now if we played around a bit, we could reduce the particle life so that the switch happens more quickly and we could so, do other things. Ryan, uh, that kind a of question, thing. question popped up. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Could you use a math uh, sign instead of keyframes, or would you suggest to keyframe it uh, if you want to keep it looping? What would be the better choice in your opinion? Well, I mean, for this uh, specific effect, I would recommend uh, keying it, because what we want to do is just have a quick uh, transitional period. And if you're doing transitions, it's always a lot easier to key something than rely on a mathematical formula to do something and hopefully come out with the same answer that you were hoping for. So cool. that would be my suggestion. All right, all right, that definitely makes sense. Um, okay, uh, here's another one. Can you please explain how to set up a simple rigid body physics system? That is a good question right there. I don't think we have that great many of tutorials about it, but I'd like to mention that every time when you open Notch, there's three tabs available for you. Latest project files, uh, templates, and uh, showcase files. So if you go to the third tab, there's quite a few samples of very nice setups with rigid bodies and physics. But uh, Ryan, carry away. <laughs> oh, sure. So um, there's a couple different ways you can set up um, rigid, uh, a rigid body effect. I'm just going to do a very basic one now. So this would be... Let's say we have a cloner system and we're going to have a grid of clones and uh, let's say we want four. All right, so here's our grid of clones. Um, boxes are more fun to watch animate, spheres just sort of roll around. So what we want to do is we want to have this stack of cubes fall onto the floor plane. Add a skylight as well because it's a bit hard to see when everything is lit really flat. So at the moment, they're not going to do anything because they haven't been given any physics attributes. And with clones, we have a rigid body effector node. Now, what this node does is allows you to 
uh, apply physics to a group of clones. So it's going to give each of these clones a rigid body, and then it's going to animate them accordingly. So now when I press play, you can see all the clones move down, they fall, and they bounce around. Now the reason they're quite floaty is because the gravity is, we could increase the gravity to make them less floaty. We could also turn down the bounciness, increase the friction. How does that change it? Well, now they don't bounce at all. So <laughs> really solid blocks now. That's a little bit better. Now another thing to do, we can do, because at the moment it's all falling quite rigidly, is we can add a randomize effector, Oops. which only comes up if you spell it properly. So now, if I just quickly set it to infinite, we tell it to rotate all of these randomly. So now we can see how they're all going to react still and they're all going to bounce around just like we'd expect. Now, the other thing I would mention here is the ordering of these effectors here. So at the moment, the clones are getting randomized, they're getting the rotations change, changed, and then they're having a rigid body simulation being applied. If we were to do this the other way, we can see that they start intersecting. And that's because if we view their rigid bodies, now the rigid body effector simulation is being rendered, and then the mesh is afterwards being uh, rotated by the randomized effector. So it's important to um, no make sure you get the ordering right with these, because otherwise these uh, the rigid body isn't going to be oriented the correct way and the randomized effector is going to start uh, clipping with the ground and you're going to sort of get a very confusing uh, look. Now the second way we can use a cloner, which is a little bit uh, more advanced and is generally the way uh, I'd see a lot of people uh, using it, would be with the rigid body root. To be honest, I think it's fair to mention now that uh, this file that Ryan is working on will definitely be saved and available for a download if that was not mentioned yet. So, yep, yeah, there will be a reference file available. Yeah, yeah, of course. So here I'm just going to make something very basic using Shake3Ds. We'll have these two here move that way. These two here move that way. Maybe a little bit further. Right. And we'll make these two rounded boxes. So now we can give these uh, shape three Ds physics because they're underneath a rigid body root. And just to show that, I'm going to add a force effector. I'm going to tell them to all be attracted to the center of this body. Now, just pressing play, nothing's going to happen. That's because we haven't told these objects to actually have any physics. If we go into the physics attributes, you can see they're all set to kinematic. Now, kinematic, I should have used my better mouse, but now I'm just going to be scrolling all day. Um, kinematic means that uh, the particle, the particles, the shapes will interact with other surfaces, but they're not going to uh, move themselves unless they're pushed. Dynamic means that they are going to be moving, they are going to be dynamic and affected by other rigid bodies. So now, oops, I forgot to turn off gravity. Now we can see that these rigid bodies are all moving around and interacting with each other. Let's just add a skylight so we can actually see what's going on a little bit better. So you can see these particles, these particles, these shapes are moving around pretty nicely. I'll just increase the um, speed. Yeah, there we go. Now they're all really trying to push really hard to move into this surface. And I, I, the only extra thing I'd mention here is we can also increase the dampening and the smoothing so that over time they sort of uh, don't um, vibrate too much and things like that. So. Um, yeah, you can also increase the update rate steps. Uh, increasing this update frame rate also really helps and makes things uh, run a lot faster. Those would be uh, just general recommendations there. I think it's maybe worth it to point out that if you have any questions about specific nodes, you can always just press on a question uh, icon in the top of the node, and you will be yep. brought to the manual. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. Ryan, do you care to demonstrate that? Do you want to risk it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go for it. Hey, there we go. Yep, there it is. And now we have a right. much a much deeper breakdown of what exactly is going on and what these uh, attributes are doing. Yeah, because like Shape Three D has a ton of settings, and uh, it's it's worthy to check out in the manual what what this uh, these settings do actually. So next one, they're not spe specialists. Uh, I'm facing issues with RealSense camera. Pre please tell me why Notch does not recognize RealSense device as depth camera. Well, we we won't gonna go through this now, I think, because we don't have real sense camera available for us now in the stream. But we will say this: uh, we definitely recommend using Kinect to real sense breaks their SDK quite very often, to be honest. Yeah, the and the quality is really bad on the real sense cameras. I think their resolution is like three twenty or something, whereas even the Kinect uh, Two is double that in resolution. Yeah, it's it's a cool product, but I don't think it actually is. I don't think it's made for installations and art things. It's more for AI to handle things. So, uh, yeah, it's not perfect uh, tool for for what you try to achieve here, I guess. Yeah, I would say it's just not reliable enough to use, especially in a live setting. So the next one is more of a challenge than a question. Oh no! How how would one do animated fractals in Notch? Ah, okay. So. Animated fractals will depend on the um, kind of fractal you want to do. So if we look at a fractal like this or like this or any of these like really fluid gradiented fractals, they're um, obviously mathematically generated and really, really complex. So I would simply advise if you're doing something like this, you want to be using uh, the custom shader and writing your own um, code to do that because this supports HLSL. Uh, I'm not very familiar with HLSL, but um, as far as I understand, uh, that would be your best bet if you wanted to get like a real fractal uh, shape. However, there are some cases where you can actually create a fractal in Notch. If we go back to this image and we look at the Sapinski triangle, oops. Yep, the Sapinski triangle, that can be easily animated in Notch. It's just a pile of cloners being set up in the right way. Or we could even look at the uh, snowflake. I think it's pretty obvious how you could clone that kind of thing, but just for the sake of showing off, I'll give it a go anyway. So we'll take this shape here. If we want it to be a circle, we hit three, great. Now we've got our base triangle. Now if I had a cloner, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multi-parent it. Sometimes you can get away with this, sometimes you can't. Don't always assume that this will work. But in this case, I'm going to do a radial uh, clone. I only want three because I want one on uh, each side radially. And I want it to be on this plane. Now if I change the radius on this down a little bit. I think it was 0.6 recurring. And I rotate this by ooh, something like that. 60, oops, six, zero. Now I'll just reduce the clone scale until they match. Right about there. Yeah, 0.3 recurring. Now we've set up this clone, all we need to do is copy paste it, attach, and reattach. And then do this until you're tired of making your fractal. So now we keep going, keep going, copy paste. Now the limitations here, if you can if you can imagine the math, each one of these is cloning, is multiplying the number, oops the uh, number of polygons by three. So you can imagine how long it takes before this starts to cause you problems. But we can zoom in quite far already. It's all, and it's pretty much a fractal already. In fact, if I take a null, just break these two connections and use this instead. 
Now I can just scale this up so I don't have to zoom in so far. And just keep copying. And that'd be at least for self-similar fractals which use fairly simple geometric shapes. This would be a workaround, I'd suggest. I think we're getting into insane uh, computational numbers here, cloning a cloner, a cloner, a cloner, of a cloner, of a cloner. And all cloning one shape. <laughs> Inception. And then as we get zoom in now, you see we're really getting into like the limitations of what can be done. I can't even zoom in further than this. Anyway, there's a there's a very very basic uh, copy of a fractal. Looks good. Okay, so next question: Is there a way to control the pivot point of an object? Okay, so if you want to do so, in short, no, we don't um, allow you to change the pivot point of any object. If I take uh, this object for example. It's just a shape 3D. Actually, let's let's have a little more fun. Let's use Armin's world famous pig. We'll take that. We'll <laughs> get uh, let's get some basic sky lighting so we can truly appreciate the world famous pig. I I have a thing for for making sort of batches and settings with pigs. It's just fun. I'm sorry, <laughs> nobody's perfect. It's just fun. I'm offering no judgment, aside from the judgment I'm offering. So let's say I wanted to, instead of moving it from its bottom point, because clearly the pivot is at the midpoint here, let's say I wanted to change the pivot to be from the center. So in this case, I would move this object so that its midpoint is around the center of the node graph. Let's say that this is about right. And then I would parent it to a null instead. And now the null basically controls its transforms and you can see it's rotating and stretching based on that scale. Or uh, based on this rotation. It was such a fine looking pig and look what you've done with it. Uh, well, he was looking at me funny. <laughs> okay, uh, are we good to go, go further? Are we good to address the next question? Yeah, sure, let's go. All right, uh, next one. I am trying to import a custom FBX editable spline from 3ds Max. However, I cannot see it or modify it in a notch. Okay, so... Um... Oh, my poor cat's getting upset that she's being ignored now. Your cat is as big of a part of these streams as, as you or I. <laughs> she definitely wants to be. Right, so... Uh, what were we saying? We were saying... So, uh, custom splines from custom 3ds splines. Max, yes, sorry. so F FBX splines, basically. So, the thing with splines is, um, we up until recently, we didn't actually support FBX splines. We will support it in uh, 9.23, but for it's now... Good to, before we... you go on, it's good to mention that at the current build, we do support Cinema 4D splines, if anything. Yes, of course. I always, I always forget the Cinema 4D splines. Um, you are not the Cinema 4D guy, are you? No, not at all. I like, uh, but for the sake of um, just showing it off, we do. Uh, Notch does have its own internal spline system. Yeah, actually, our splines are quite neat because they are flexible. Basically, they are organic, so you can move the points as you please. Uh, unless you need a spline for a specific camera path, I would always advocate that you should make your splines in Notch because, again, it's it's a moving, breathing object. You can modify it, you can offset it, you can keyframe it. I think Ryan will show that just now. Yeah, so I can take this spline here, I can rotate it, scale it a little bit, and now I can take a um, clone to spline, for example, and we can use this as, this spline as a source. And this is Could effectively we... the same setup we would use with uh, any imported spline. The Could we close is, this hmm? spline, by the way? Because now it's just two points. Can we can we loop it, for instance? Of course we can. There's a button for that. Greatness, greatness. <laughs> so I'll just uh, reduce this spline scale, so we're getting a little bit smaller. There we go. 
in fact, when Ryan mentioned splines, like if you type in splines, you will see that there's many options. Like you can use it for particles, for clones. You can just set a spline follower. There's there's a variety of options for you available. Yeah, so in this case, for example, I'll just add a skylight because it's always a nicer way to view a scene. But if we were looking at an interactive setup, it would be a lot nicer if we could like move around this sort of spline or change its rotation. And that's what this allows for you is to have that control and flexibility, which you might not get from an imported spline. And I can, uh, or I don't know, let's scale them down a little bit, get some randomness in there, maybe up the scale. And yeah, this is the kind of thing you can do with uh, splines. They're really nice and they're really easy to control. And this I made in five seconds whilst distracted by my cat. So I'm pretty sure you can do a lot better. <laughs> and again, if Ryan was to, to grab any of the nulls or set a modifier on it, like you can just make it movable. So if you take a null and just scrub it back and forward, that could be math modifier applied there or you name it. Um, all right, uh, I guess, uh, are you still working on this one or should we? No, should we... let's move on. Cool. Uh, so further up, is there a way to import vector from from apps files or EPS files, for example? Very good question right there and a very valid request, to be honest. At the given moment, it is not possible, but definitely something something we should have in the future, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like that kind of thing because I really like using Illustrator. In fact, it's definitely in the in the development list. It's just a question how how soon will it move up the move up the ladder? Mm, yeah. All right. Uh, you're gonna like the next one, Ryan. Skylight node seems uh, Skylight node seems to make things really slow, even at an almost empty scene. Is there something I can do about that? You always use Skylight. You abuse it. Can you give some tips on how to make it run faster? Uh, that's a pot kettle black right there, Armin, but I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. Um, so the the skylight um, is generally only expensive for like uh, less um, powerful GPUs, um, a reasonable GPU, and you can do a lot of your scene with it. And now with uh, the bake lighting support, you could do a lot more advanced stuff uh, with the skylight and just turn it off. But for now, for this scene, let's say for a dynamic scene, there are things we can do to optimize it. We can reduce the sample directions. I usually find that 128, oops, 128 is a pretty good uh, middle ground. You can get away with that a lot of times. Um, you can also decrease the shadow map size. Um, each of, uh, it just basically reduces the uh, amount of sh the shadow accuracy for it. But oftentimes you can get away with that without it being noticeable. The main one, uh, as I can hear Armin is jumping to get to, is this num sample directions per frame. If you reduce this, especially for a static scene, you really won't notice a visual difference, but the performance will be much, much better. And it's because you're reducing the number of these samples that we're double checking uh, per, fr well, not double checking, just uh, sampling per frame. You caught me there. Yeah, I, I was about to speak about number sample directional. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to finish that uh, that uh, handle, that name. But I think it's worthy to mention here that uh, Skylight can work in unison with environment map. That, that's quite sure. nice. Sure, we can add environment map. Uh, I will just uh, make this as easy as possible. Simple environment map. Um, one I found off the internet, it's a bit bright, so I'll just bring it down a little bit. I, I would make it omnidirectional too, to be honest. That just makes it look much nicer. Yes, because um, at the moment it's only it's only sampling the top half of the environment map. We really want it to sample the whole. Oh, look at that! Map. Look at that! Now, take to this. Let's put it on the spline offset. Oh, that's too fast. I think maybe it's worthy to mention the, the, the point cache too in this case. Uh, what do you think, Ryan? Yeah, sure. The point cache is another way, it's a really, really advanced node and it can do really nice things if you know what you're doing with it. Um, effectively, what we're doing is we're generating a bunch of points on the surface for of uh, each uh, mesh. 
and then we're using that to um, increase the quality of our skylight because instead of sampling from these uh, point lights we're sampling from these points themselves and you can see it's using uh, by default it's using a really large number of points and if I just reduce yeah you can probably reduce it to here and it won't be too noticeable so you can see here as I'm changing the number of points here you don't really notice until it gets very low so we can probably get away with sort of 0 0.4 0 0.3 or 0.43 and it will be uh, visually the same but again we'll get a big performance boost because it's um, sampling less of our mesh. To be honest while we were on this subject I I'd say that a good way to make sure what eats the most uh, GPU or CPU in your scene is just enabling profiler for a while then you get numeric values on every single node that is actually costly so of course it's not exactly what the was asked, but I think that could contribute in optimizing your scene even on a broader scale than just lighting. Yeah, we can see here, if I just increase this back up, that, uh, oh, it's actually not impacted too much. We could probably get away with quite a lot of uh, really advanced lighting techniques on this scene. What, what graphics card are you running now, Ryan? An RTX 2080. It's very forgiving. It's that a, one is forgiving. I'm very happy with it. Cool. Uh, yeah, We've got another so, question. Uh, before we move on, I would just mention that you shouldn't keep the profiler on all the time. You just kind of double check things and then you turn it off and then you move forward and so on and so forward. Actually, yeah, that's a very good point. You can see the frame rate down here as soon as I enable it gets much lower because it's having to take more time thinking about what's um, going on in the scene. Now we're moving on to my favorite question. Uh, am I doing a text bevel wrong? No amount of force push uh, is beveling the edge. Am I not the powerful Jedi I once thought I am? Uh, mate, the force is with you. <laughs> bevel is being reworked at the moment, so that's why it's taken out in the current version. However, it will come back uh, with even more force in the future releases. Yeah, the bevel node was really uh, the bevel option was really nice, but uh, it just doesn't uh, didn't work in a lot of cases, and we figured it was probably better to take it out, improve it, rework it, come come up with a better way of implementing it than uh, having it's... something that was really uh, ugly looking. Yeah, plus it can become quite expensive uh, in in very rapid fashion. It it needs to be optimized for for real time workflows basically. So there is a bit of work on that, but it's definitely coming back in the future releases. All right. Yeah, exactly. Next one. I value speedy workflows. What are your best speed up tips for working a notch? Uh, seeing as node based systems can be slow. Fair question, actually. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think everyone sort of has their uh, little list of things that they end up gravitating towards. One thing I really like is something you've probably seen me doing uh, all stream so far, which is the control R to quickly parent things together. So I can take all of these nodes in just without even thinking. I can throw in a primitive emitter. I can throw in a curl noise fluid effector and just select all three of all four of these nodes and they all parent correctly when I just hit control R. Boom. The other thing that's really useful is if I have a much more complex scene, which is really huge, and I just want to move this block of particles, if I hold shift, all the particle node, all of these nodes underneath, all the child nodes will move along with your uh, root node. You can also do this for inputs as well. So if I add a color ramp to, let's say, the primitive emitter, now, if I hold shift, we can see again, the child node is going with it uh, as well. And every node which is connected underneath will go as well. So you can really easily just group things and move them around this way. Talking about grouping, we can actually mark up the specific node groups as well. Yeah, good point. We have the region node as well. So if I take all of this and I get a region node, I just take all of this, put it under a region. I mean, first of all, this helps a lot with just visualizing everything in the scene. So now I can see like very visibly, even though I'm over here, there's a block of something over here. And this block is um, control is like a hub of an effect. 
and surely we can change colors and change naming conventions. Yeah, we can call this a particle system. I can change the color to be more orange. I'm colorblind, so I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but something like that. <laughs> oh, that's gotta be wrong. That's so uh, another thing that I find sort of speeds up my workflow is the control E. Yeah. Or Eagle. It just jumps to the node list basically so it can type away the name straight away. Control E. I want a trail renderer. And if you Boom. press the arrow key down and just literally press on the node, it will drop the node exactly where your mouse is in the node graph. Sure, let's get an edge detect. You're saying arrow key down? Yep. Boom. Control R. We're edge detecting the grid through. <laughs> we are these fully particles. edge detected. <laughs> It's like a uh, portal to another world. What else? Maybe finding a specific node could be hand, uh, handy. There, there's a shortcut for that as well. Yeah, so if I'm lost way over here, I can use Control F and let's go back to our primitive. Boom, we've found our primitive emitter and we're centered on it. Another thing we can do is we can press A, same thing, but we're going to set it to center on the root node or any selected node as well. And I guess it's worthy to mention then uh, the option to select things straight in the viewport too. Oh, sure, yeah. So if I take a shape 3D, we just move it out of the way of all of our particles. And just hit P, you can see this icon has enabled. And now when I select something in the viewport, it will select it in the node graph as well. And it means that we can manipulate it, move away, do something else, P, select it, move it around. Super useful when you're using, when you're looking at a really complex scene. Yeah, definitely comes handy. Um, obviously, there are more things that could come handy. So I would say if you check manual uh, shortcuts listing, you will find quite a few uh, handy tips there. Yeah, yeah, lots of them. <laughs> uh, okay, next request. That's definitely a request. Ryan, can you build a simple connect based setup? Uh, let's say I'm going to task you. Can you build something that would use Connect Mesh uh, as a emitter? Let's say particle system. Uh, okay. So let's see. If I make a new layer. So we want to. Oops. I want use to use uh, Connect Connect Mesh's uh, depth information as a, a mesh emitter for a particle system. Please and thank you. <laughs> okay. Sure. So. Uh, we'll do we'll do this the easy way. We don't have to overcomplicate things. I'm gonna bring in a connect mesh. You can see here, this is just a guy jamming out. I think this was used for something Yanni did a few years back. And we'll take, let's see, a connect mesh, a uh, connect depth mesh. Pull this from here. So at the moment, now, oops, I didn't realize I zoomed out quite so far. Well, and we've got no lighting in the scene as well. So just add an ambient light. So now we can see our man sort of uh, being automatically displaced and moved around by this node. If we want to emit particles from him, we can easily just add a mesh emitter. I'll take in a particle root as well. Love that. We can't see anything, so let's add a let's add a trail renderer this time. When we add the trail renderer initially, we won't see anything, even if I set this to alpha and just blend it down a bit. Oh, interesting, that hasn't worked. Oh, it has. How peculiar. Right. Let's not do that then. Let's just uh, set the Oops. Yeah, let's just go as it, uh, how it, at it as is. So if I, at the moment, the part of, we're not seeing any particles because the trail renderer is uh, not moving. It's emitting part, the particles being emit, but they're not moving at all. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. Basically, anytime you add the trail renderer and you don't see nothing happening, well, you have to give motion to it. So you have to have an effect or at least one of, of the effectors in the scene. So in this case, I'm going to add a trail render. Oh, that's glitchy. That's like instant art. Yeah, apparently. 
I would assume that is because the uh, connect mesh is constantly reordering its uh, displaced uh, geometry. So once we add a trail renderer, each point, each trail doesn't know which point in the mesh it's following. So let's just go with a point, uh, a point renderer instead. And we will. There we go. Yeah, it's a lot more uh, reasonable. We can probably smooth it up if we were to spend more time going through and organizing exactly what's happening. I'll just turn off the visibility. Now we can see all of our particles. Change the size down a little bit. That's like we've got a point cloud of this span. Can you hide the mesh actually, just so I, that we only see the particles, for instance? Believe it or not, I already did. Oh, that's just particles. That's nice. Yeah. Cool. I I think that kind of answers the question. Obviously, in the very same capacity, the depth camera uh, connect mesh can be plugged into fields and to well any system that takes it or or procedurals, for instance. Yeah, there's a lot you can do here to sort of make it look a lot nicer. Because this cool. is a bit uh, ugly, to be honest. <laughs> Well, it's a start point. It's yeah. a start point, so let's not be so uh, judgmental here. Um, okay, next one. Uh, how do I use trail emitter? Trail emitter? Ah, yes. okay. Trail emitter is super easy. So the first thing we want to do if we want to use the trail emitter, this is becoming very particle heavy, isn't it? Well, I guess I guess particles is what people like to do. So it's, it's what the people wanted. <laughs> That's what they want. <laughs> because you gotta, we, we just gotta, we gotta give in. Uh, okay, yep. so we'll do the same thing as I've done a few times before. Uh, we'll get a point renderer in. Here we go. Now, um, what I'm envisioning here is only a few particles are going to be our like source points because the trail emitter is going to emit particles in a trail from particles that have already existed in the scene. So. If I now bring in the trail emitter, it is currently working, but we're not seeing anything because these particles aren't moving. Now, if I add a velocity effector here, oops, and if I tell these uh, to move to repel, now what we can see is that both the primitive, uh, the original particles, and the trail particles are being pushed at the same time. If I change this so that now it's only being applied to our original uh, emitter, now we can see our trails are beginning, our trailed particles are beginning to come in. And here, once again, we have uh, uh, our controlling particle emitters sort of thing, where we can see these particles are sort of killing, stopping after a while. And it's simply because they're reaching that max cap. So you, if we reduce the life of them, we certainly can see we get these trails moving a lot more. I could also slow down the emission rate quite a bit. I could also just increase the max cap. Currently, both of these particles uh, emitters are fighting over a number of particles of 64,000. If I was to increase this to like a million and give this, let's say 300,000 to work with and really reduce this emission rate. Now we're gonna see a lot more particles existing in the scene, maybe a little longer. And if we want them to move around only on their own, again, we can just do this, just reduce this a little bit. Yeah. Now we can see we have particles, which they get emit, they follow along these trails, and then they slowly die off. In fact, I'll just lower this a bit more so it's a little more clear. This starts to look really nice. Yeah, I really love this kind of thing. It's a yeah, really cool. nice effect. It mm, looks like you definitely. get this you get this sort of fizz of smoke behind a, a fast moving particle, especially if you increase the velocity effector to like 10. So I guess that's the fun part using notch. Basically, you can just push it and push it and tweak it and you literally see it updating live, which I really enjoy because I have big OCD waiting for traffic lights to change. This speaks to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, okay, can we move on then? Is there something more to mention here? Or are we good to, to go further? Uh, I've, I've had my fun. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, all right. One more question we have is, uh, 
Is there a way to treat a video source as a select child treat smash? So if I understand correctly, uh, this question is about being able to choose whichever the video is being shown at the time. So basically you have several sources to choose from and you can just uh, scrub through and choose whichever the one is being shown because that's exactly how select child works. In fact, can you show both select child and the option for a video that would be equal to select child? Well, sure. Um, I think it was here. We already touched on the video multiplexer. I'll just do another example of that. So for here. the video, it's, it's video multiplexer. Yep. So what this node does is let's take this one, this one. Yeah, we've got two videos and an image. Boop. We got here. That classic guitar. Which there was we'll a never question escape. in a in the chat. How would you see the thumbnail of a playing video? So Ryan is pressing oh. Shift double click. Yep, Shift double click, and that can yep. work. That can be done for any video node. So just Shift double click. You can see what's going on. I can uh, add a key color mask for this one. Just green, actual green. Output mask only. And you can see it's starting to take effect. Oh, I haven't set it up properly, but you can see um, edge detect would have been a much better visual for that. You can see it's being applied and you can continue this on for the whole video chain. I would say um, while you're editing, if you do this for every single node, just remember that every single one of these thumbnails is going to be ed going to be playing at the same time. And you can slow down your node graph just by filling it with video loaders. And I would suppose you just sources. double check and you collapse it. That's yeah, just the best. If you're it, you don't, you generally won't need to like in this scene, it's fine. But if you're doing something a lot more complex, then you might have some problems. But that really is like an edge case. That is horrifying. <laughs> I am so sorry to uh, the actress there. Can you change, if you go to the edge detect, if you change the blend mode, we will all of a sudden have a little bit more pleasant way okay. of looking at it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good idea. That's a lot nicer. Yeah, that's that's. By good. comparison, that is a lot nicer. So nice. yeah, this is a very easy way to switch between um, videos. The important thing to note is this doesn't do blending. This is not, I have video A, I want to blend with video B. This is just one um, video node. Well, if you want to do a specific case, it wouldn't be like a composite node for A to B blending. Yeah, if you want, if you have uh, a specific A and a specific B that you want to blend together, that would that is a really useful way of doing it. The other option, I don't know if it's in this release or the next release, is a little bin I made called the blended video multiplexer. Regardless, if you were to download the work file that is going to be given up after after this uh, stream this is gonna gonna be there yeah exactly i'm just turn off the grid quickly because it's turning up over everything okay so now from here and it's even got an input so that you could drive this from another tool like msc or something you can see as i change this input we're blending between each of these videos which might be what you want you can change the attack and decay here for how quickly it will do this change up to you this is just a really nice way of uh, doing that kind of thing. So can we can we check out the same thing for the 3D objects, the select child, just so we covered it? Yeah, sure. So cool. the important thing to note is that you're not going to blend between objects with the select child, because object blending is a whole other kettle of fish. Kettle of fish. Isn't that a phrase I'm in? Isn't that a turn of phrase? <laughs> you're, you're the Brit in the room here. You have all the faces. <laughs> Okay. I can try to do a really bad Norwegian accent. Yeah, that sounds Norwegian to me. That's the only thing I can do. I'm not good at uh, praising yet. Well, you know more Norwegians than I do, so I can only assume that yours is 100% accurate. Oh, look at that. Gloom is correcting us both. <laughs> a whole other... He's, he's really upset with that. <laughs> right, okay, so... Cool. Let's say we've got a rounded box and a capsule. Yeah, capsule. No, capsule one. Damn straight. There we go. 
So here I can just quickly switch between any object I want. So if it's uh, two, it'll be this object, one, zero. And I can easily just add a math modifier to this input. I think it's worthy to mention that this is true not only to 3D shapes or external Im imported 3D objects. It, it can switch lights and cameras and you name it, uh, basically almost everything in the system. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, yeah. Let's go by 1.5. So now we can see we're seeing each of these objects. But yeah, as Armin said, you can use it to change, uh, change between pretty much everything. If you want one emitter to be run and then another emitter to run, you want another um, one object to show, you want one material to go, that kind of thing. It's all doable with the select child node. So one interesting question popped up in the chat, uh, and it's related to the anamorphic setups for camera reprojections. Um, can we make a little setup where we have a material with mapping node, and that mapping node is fed to a camera, and it's projecting the, the, the material through the camera? OK, so you want to do like, hold on, yeah. hold on, Re rephrase. Is that the reprojection we're talking about? Yeah, basically. Basically, well, at least that's a good starting point, and I think from there on, uh, for there on, the users can just take it further. Okay, so let's say is it? Is it... Oh, d please don't delete this, please and thank you. Yeah, no, I'm Make saying, do we want to take this and just uh, and just um, project it onto a surface, for example? Yeah, yeah, for instance, correct. Okay, well, just to make this look. Nice. Maybe we should go for the more static look, or if you can slow down the math modifier. Yeah, it's a bit fast. You know what, I'm Will? Being, uh, I'm being fussy bridges here. No, that's fine. I'll make it seem like it's smoother by adding a lot of frame feedback. And I'll set it to, yeah, blend. Is that better? Does that feel more like it's blending together, Armin? That's yes. less intrusive to my eye. Yeah. So basically what I'd like to see is a material applied that has a mapping node and maybe we can just talk uh, three, four sentences of what mapping node does and basically pipe in a camera through mapping node. That's pretty much it. Okay, sure. So we'll, hmm. I haven't necessarily got a texture to apply, but let's just make a new layer anyway. I, I guess we can use any generator as a texture as well. Yeah, that's a good point. So let's get a simple shape 3D, good old standard shape 3D, and we'll take a skylight as well, because we want to look at this thing and make it look nice and pretty and well lit. So got our object. Um, I prefer the rounded box. I just think it looks nicer. Indeed, it does look nicer. I'll give it a material, and we'll say, let's take, what 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 generator Trichet, would you like? Truchette. Do you Trichet. want the Always Truchette. Sure. There you go. There's your, there's your Truchette, Armin. I, and I, I definitely, this, this shouldn't be rounded. This shouldn't, shouldn't be, rounded. be rounded? This shouldn't be rounded. Untick rounded. Sure. Please and thank you. We have arrived. This looks great. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. It almost lines up. Yeah. That's, uh, that is purely coincidence. Anyway, because uh, the uh, mapping probably isn't set up right for the shape 3D. Anyway, so we've got our shape 3D, and we have a material applied to it. Let's say we wanted to just plane and map this from the front. So I'll add a mapping node. So the mapping node is going to set the mapping for how a texture applies to a surface. So in this case, it's by default doing a planar map. So if I hide this object for a second and select this, you can see this is the shape it is, um, or the sort of area along which it's applying this texture. And you can maybe see it. I don't know how well it comes across on Twitch, but you can see it is applying along that surface. So if I actually pull it out here, we can see that is the direction it is, apply it is applying along. If I rotate it, 
we can see we're applying it along a slightly different direction, rotated downwards. We can get these really nice sort of skewed effects. But if you look at it from the right perspective, it all looks uh, normal. And then as you pull away, it all stretches out. I always like that kind of thing. It's sort of like the forced perspective stuff. Yeah, you can you can really come up with some odd and interesting textures working like that. Yeah, exactly. It's a really really nice little thing you can uh, play with. So if we can check out the mapping type uh, camera, I think it's called camera. Sure. Just expand. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So let's say. I want this mapping so that it's always facing the camera. It always, like, no matter how I look at this object, this material looks like it's flat on the surface. What we can, that's called a camera mapping, so we, or a perspective map. So from this camera's perspective, if I just right click, set to current view, right now when we look through this camera, this is what the camera can see. So if I change this trans the transform modifiers on this mapping node, it's going to overwrite this cat this uh, mapping uh, node's positions, and it's going to uh, move itself so that it is in the same position as this camera, and it's got the same um, transformation values as well. So as I move around this with this camera, we can see this object. Is being applied is having mapping it's mapping applied from the camera's perspective or from the camera's position now the key thing to note is it's not the camera's perspective i don't know again how well this comes up but you should be able to see a little bit of warping along each face especially around the midpoint and this is because even though it's using the camera's uh, position it's not using the perspective mapping so i set this to perspective now we can see the only reason we know it's being lit uh uh, attached differently is because of the lighting. If we condense it down a little bit, it's five by five. We also need to set to generate per pixel. This uh, means it has to regenerate the shader, so it usually takes a couple of seconds. But now we can see it really is just the only reason we know this is a cube is because of the lighting being applied to it. And if we change our perspective, we can see that that's the kind of mapping we're getting. And this kind of thing can be useful in a lot of different contexts. It depends on uh, exactly how you are setting up this scene. I tend to find that uh, I only need a reprojector to uh, use a perspective camera when I'm reprojecting something. But uh, for a simple uh, use case like this, it can come up with something really neat. Any more comments, Simon? Uh, yeah, there's one, uh, and I'm answering that. Uh, yeah, basically there is one asking, can this be translated to UV and reprojected and so on and so forth? And I'm saying that, you know what, that's such a fine question that that can become a stream of its own. Basically. Yeah, you, uh, uh, reprojection is effectively the same thing, but uh, you'll have to tie and make sure that this camera is in the same position as another camera. And uh, it's a it's a much wider topic. We can um, discuss. I am it sure time. we can just set it up for one of those upcoming streams and just talk about it for the full hour, basically, because there's so much to cover. There's so yeah. much to talk about in that one. Yeah, it's a full workflow. Hmm. Um, we are through and done with our list of submitted questions. Um, we've answered the one that really stood out as uh, as something that might come handy to a user, the one with the mapping node. Uh, let's give a chance to the guys to to, to, to ask one or the other question sure. more, and I guess we can call it a day because it's already an hour we are blabbering here. <laughs> sure. I, I'm just doing a point. great job, by the way. I'm super proud and happy how you are handling this. This is great. Oh, thank you. Um, but yeah, so the, just to point out, um, if we look through the UV camera now, we can see the kind of mapping that is done, and the Shape 3D doesn't have a very good uh, mapping. If I used to use... Um, do you know if this Toon Pork has a good UV map? Uh, I I wouldn't really remember if this little piggy is actually decent in the UV. <laughs> I would doubt it, but we can give it a spin. Well, there's only one way to find out. So yep, same thing yep. again. We can see this uh, little pig is uh, being mapped with that same texture. Um, if in fact, where is this camera? It's quite far away. 
I'm just going to move it a little bit closer. Oop, it's not even facing the cat, the pig. There we go. A little bit nicer of a texture. A little stripy pig. I so, have nothing against striped pigs. This is <laughs> this is looking good, I think. Yeah, it's fine enough. So now let's find out if it has a UV map. We'll take it into the object nodes uh, input. How does it look? Oh, do you look at that? It's uh, actually textured. It's not, it's not too bad. So um, uh, the person talking about the um, UV texture, yeah, this is effectively what you'd uh, be expecting to get out. You're getting um, your uh, UV map all uh, with your textures applied to it. If I actually go in and I add, uh, let's say, a directional light. Yeah, and just to mention, if you want to push it even further, let's say have particles on this or cloners, that would be rendered to texture. But again, it's it's quite a fast subject. I'd love to make a separate thing just about that because it's, it's rather an interesting subject. Yeah, it's that kind of thing which can be really uh, useful. So you can apply lighting to it and it'll update in real time. You can... Sometimes you can get away, not all post effects are going to work in this setup, but I find that you can sometimes get away with edge detect. And while you get an edge along all your UVs, if you're uh, clever with where you place your UVs, you won't necessarily see that. And you can have this. So to, to demonstrate this working, I guess if Ryan would make yet another layer and just layer pre uh, this as a uh, color material, that would just showcase the, this very workflow. Whoop, wrong one. Layer pre-comp. Uh, we'll you need the same biggie. Tune pig. Bring in our material. Come on. Yeah. There we go. Bring this back in. And then select, uh, what layer are we on now? 14. It'd be really good if I'd named these. <laughs> so as you see now, it's being inherited. Uh, uh, not, not yet, because um, due to the way that um, I can't remember what it is, but it's like DirectX 11. Well, what, due to the way it stores images, these things get flipped. So we need to add a transform node. Ten points. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to change the background on this as well because everything's black at the moment, right? Now we'll flip it in Y, I think it is. Yeah, there we go. And now if I was to, oh God, I've gotten lost. <laughs> Too many layers. I got layers. lost in Armin. I got lost. <laughs> Too many layers. Right, so now if I was to up the, lower this. Or give it the color, the for scale. instance, that would be a very obvious change. Yeah, sure, let's give it some red. And yeah, this that'll is, do. Uh, this is getting to be one evil piggy. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll lower this so it's a little bit nicer. Now when we come in, oh, I've done it again. I've done it again. There we go. Now we can see our pig. And again, you can see the edges of the UV map, but uh, if you, yeah, that's just because of the way edge detect works. If you um, come up with better uh, ways to hide it or uh, you use, uh, better UVs and things like that. Or just don't use edge tech and use something else. There's or just don't use pigs. That's that's an option too. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, you can probably apply edge detect to the material rather than to the... Um... I've got to stop using this thing because I'm going to get lost. Yeah, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really help you at all. <laughs> I'll do it here yeah, instead. But... I think I think we are we are getting to a point where uh, it's it's sort of clear what's going on here and how does it go. Obviously now we are referring to another layer, but uh, this could be set up and exported to let's say media server. So if media server is running the same object like the same piggy and that's our mappable object, well that's pretty much it. That's how you set it up. Um, I don't really see any more questions coming in, uh, so I guess we are we're good. We're we're done today. Um, oh, are we done? Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, Ryan. You were great. Thank you and, for uh, letting me drive. <laughs> and sure not... thing. I think we're going to have this back and forward much, much more. <laughs> How much chromatic blur is enough? There's never enough chromatic blur. More is more.
More is more. <laughs> shall we fa shall we end on the ugliest thing we can possibly make? Uh, I, I don't uh, that the evil in me speaks yes, but the same person says we shouldn't. <laughs> well, the evil in me has control. Oh no, faith to black. <laughs> oh faith god. To black. <laughs> oh. All right, uh, we're done here. <laughs> Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming in and uh, asking questions. I hope you got the answers you 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 wanted. Uh, ho hopefully, there's uh, well, not hopefully. Actually, this is going to be an on-running theme, so we're gonna do this once in a while. So yeah, let's carry on talking on the Facebook user group. That's a very good place to to get together and ask questions and get answers. Uh, otherwise, we're looking forward to see some cool stuff that you guys come up with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and we'll see you on the next one. We'll